Wow, good evening, good evening. Um, again, my name is Pastor Antonio Bowen. I am your uh, YCLC National Co-Chair. On tonight, we are here gathered to learn and glean some great, great information. On tonight, we will be going ahead and opening up with prayer. And we want to invite up uh, Bishop Nancy Rosaro. I probably just messed up her last name. Please forgive me. Who is the ACLC woman um, subregion uh, cup? Uh, oh my goodness! How did I just get so tongue twisted under thirty seconds? Bishop Nancy, uh, pray us in and pray for my tongue twistedness. So tonight, you know, I want to thank ACLC and 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 all the ministry and the staff for asking me to um, open up in prayer in this very important um, teaching entitled Chosen. So um, I will ask everyone to let's just uh, bow our heads or close our eyes, however you want to feel, but we will um, have a reverence in our prayer. Heavenly Father, in the blessed name of your beloved son, Jesus Christ, we all come before you, Father, thanking you. First of all, thanking you for the forgiveness of our sins, the salvation of our souls, the redemption of our very lives, O Lord, because you are guiding us into a life that is better than what it is in this world, a life that is eternal. But while we're here, we thank you, Lord, as we are visiting this earth that you have placed us in. You play, Even before we were placed in our mother's womb, you knew each and every one of us, and you knew what each and every one of us was capable of. And tonight we are all here in a unified teaching lord so i ask you father to bless this teaching tonight bless this wonderful title called chosen because your word says that we have not chosen you but you have chosen us to be sincerely devoted to you to be your servants here on earth to continue kingdom building for eternity i ask and i pray that your holy spirit will encamp around each and every one of us wherever we are right now and that your Holy Spirit will rest upon our Reverend Tanya Edwards as she guides and she performs and, and gives us this teaching entitled Chosen. We thank you, Father. We thank you. We thank you for the teachings of our Father and Mother Moon, of the divine principle, because they're teaching us not just a religion, but a way of life, a way of life that is pleasing unto you, Lord, a way of life that is called to servant. For we are first servants, no matter what title we have, we are called to be servants for each other, to love you above all things and to love each other as we love ourselves. So we pray that we do love ourselves, O oh Lord, because in loving ourselves and loving you, we will never offend anyone else because we look to never offend you. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for this class. Bless everyone that is on this virtual meeting Computer tonight. Computer is active. And, and I pray, oh Lord, right now, yes, over that computer of uh, Reverend Edwards in her house, right now, mm -hmm. I send you angels, your angels that are IT and technical, because Same. you have angels Close to the short, oh Lord. You have angels of all kinds to come right now, Lord, and help her to get the computer and everything straight, oh Lord, so that this teaching will go through in the name of Jesus. Lord. Send your angels right now, Lord. Send your angels right now to grant peace. To grant, we trust in you, Lord, to fix everything according to your will. So we thank you, Father. We place ourselves in your loved hands. In the blessed name of your beloved son, Jesus the Christ, we thank you. Aju. Amen. Aju and amen. Amen. Again, that was our very own Bishop Nancy, ACLC Woman in Ministry, Subnational Co-Chair. Yeah, I got it out now. <laughs> Uh, what a good night it's going to be. I am so excited because tonight is truly a great night. It is Monday. It is a, a new month. It's a new time. So, And I'm ready to learn something good on tonight. Is there anybody else that come uh, ready to learn something new, something different? So on tonight, we have no one other than our very own Dr. Tanya Edwards, woman and uh, Christian Leadership Conference Director of International Affairs. Dr. Edwards is currently is the uh, WCLC Director of 
International Affairs. She provides services with the ACLC National Executive Committee. She received the Holy Marriage Blessing with her husband, Bishop Jesse Edwards, in 2001. Uh, Bishop Edwards, I mean, Dr. Edwards has supported ACLC since its early days and has countless memories uh, spending time with the founders, Dr. Sangya Moon and Dr. Ha Jahan Moon, uh, going on speaking tours together and uh, speaking at events. And she is also a proud author of a book, A Mother's Heart. Dr. Edwards continues servicing the ACLC to this day as the WCLC liaison. Dr. Edwards is striving to continue, strive to continue the great work and un uniting the body of Christ in America and all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, if we can put our hands together and celebrate Dr. Tanya Edwards as I present to some and introduce to others, no one other than Dr. Tanya Edwards. So Dr. Edwards, are you there, ma'am? Pastor Antonio, thank you very much. It's so good to see each and every one of you here on the call. I'm going to share my screen here. Please enjoy the slides. Thank you for being with us. We're so grateful that we're here together with each and every one of you. And so I want to just recap a little bit from last week's lesson lecture. Uh, this is the realization of the purpose of creation. What was God's purpose for creation? And had his creation been realized, there would have been an ideal world with no sin. We wouldn't be where we are today. We would be living in a heavenly area, atmosphere, life, world, would have been fantastic. But when the life in the kingdom of heaven on earth comes to a close, people are to enter the spirit world and enjoy eternal life in the kingdom of heaven there. And we will still talk about the purpose of creation. In the kingdom of heaven, God's direction will be conveyed to, conveyed to all of his children. We will then know what God had felt, what God had intended, what God had wanted through the true parents of humankind, guiding us as we live each and every day as one person created by almighty God. Next. So now we're going to section four talking about the original value. Okay, so let's get started. Determination and standard of original value. Determination of original value. Now, when we go to, when we want to purchase something, we usually look at the price or we ask what the price is because we want to know what the value of that would be. What about the value of mankind, the value of the original value that we're looking at? Let's read about it. The original value of an entity is determined through the mutual relationship between the purpose of the entity according to God's ideal of creation and people's original desire to treasure it and bring out its true worth. So we're looking at um, the God-centered, that's okay, you can go to the next one. We're looking at the God-centered four-position foundation. And we want to talk about that because, first of all, you can't have a four-position foundation without God being at the top. God has got to be at the top and in the center. Then you have a person, then the entity, and then the union between each and every one, which the union is the third object partner. Let's read about that. Hence, an entity finds its true value when it participates as an object partner in a God-centered four-position foundation by relating with a person to give and take action and by their union, becoming the third object partner to God. Next. Okay, so we have the standard of the original value. What's the standard? Well, we're talking about absolute here of the original value. Since the center of this four position foundation is God, it is God who sets the standard for its value. Since God is absolute, the original value of an object partner 
determined in relationship to this standard must also be absolute. So we have the original value is absolute and we know that God is absolute. And then we have the subject partner, the object partner. And when they form that union, then it becomes absolute. How is the original beauty of a rose determined? Wow, that's really amazing. First of all, that a rose even exists out of the handiwork of God Almighty. But the beauty of it, well, what about the original beauty of it? How is it determined? Let's read about that. The original beauty of a rose is determined when the purpose for which God created it and the divinely given human desire to appreciate and bring out its beauty are fulfilled together. See, a person has to recognize there, first of all, there's a purpose and they have to also give, have a human desire to appreciate it. When you see the rose, you appreciate it right away. And then you also recognize its beauty. So appreciation and the beauty is all together as one and it's fulfilled together. So to put it another way, a person who reaches God's ideal of creation feels the fullness of joy when his desire to pursue beauty is satisfied by the emotional stimulation that the flower gives him. At that moment, the flower manifests its true beauty and the flowers become beauty becomes absolute. Now, when you look at that rose, don't you notice not only the beauty, but the fragrance of it? So it is absolute, the, not only the beauty, but the fragrance. The whole entire rose is absolute. Next. How is the original beauty of a rose determined, we ask again? Until now, no object partner's value could become absolute. It has remained relative because its relationship with fallen people was based on satanic purpose and desire. So God's ideal of creation could not be fulfilled, but the human desire for beauty and the purpose of that flower, the original reason why that flower was brought into existence and the fullness of the joy of the flower, which is true beauty, becomes absolute. Next. Original emotion, intellect, and will, and original beauty, truth, and goodness. While the human mind, which we all have, has three faculties. We have emotion, intellect, and our will. When the body responds to the mind's emotion, intellect, and will, its actions pursue the values of beauty, truth, and goodness, respectively. In other words, you cannot have all of the values unless you are first using your intellect, your mind, because that mind is going to say, hey, there's a beautiful rose. And then the mind starts saying, wow, it's beautiful. Then that's truth. It's really a rose right here in my hand and the goodness of that rose. But God is the subject partner to the human mind. Hence, he is also the subject partner to human emotion, intellect, and will. Where does that come from? Our mind. Next. Desiring to realize his original value, a person responds to the emotion, intellect, and will of God mm -hmm. through his mind, and he acts according through his body, mm -hmm. thereby manifesting the values of original beauty, original truth, and original mm -hmm. goodness. We cannot appreciate that rose until mm -hmm. our emotions are in place, our intellect, and our will, which brings the beauty, the truth, and the goodness, then we are fully an appreciation for that rose. Next. love and beauty good and evil righteousness and unrighteousness love and beauty when two entities discrete manifestations of god's dual characteristics form a common base and seek to unite 
as the third object partner to God and establish a four position foundation, they will engage and take action. In accomplishing this, the emotional force that the subject partner gives to the object partner is called love. And I think we've all been there. And the emotional force that the object partner returns to the subject partner is called beauty. The force of love is active and the stimulation of beauty is passive. So if we have a partner, we have to show love. The object partner shows love and the subject partner shows emotion from that next. In the relationship that we have between God and human beings, God gives love as a subject partner and then human beings return beauty as object partners. In the relationship between a man and a woman, the man is the subject partner. He's giving love. He's giving all of his care and, and emotions and everything to the woman while the woman is the object partner, returning beauty. But in the universe, people are the subject partners who give love to the natural world. And the natural world then returns beauty as an object partner. Next. When the subject partner and the object partner become completely one in harmony, one in harmony, that means together, love is found within beauty and beauty is found within love. It's almost like the smell and beauty of that rose is found between that man and woman. Love is found within beauty and beauty is found within love. This is because when a subject partner and object partner become one in a circular movement, the subject partner sometimes acts as the object partner and the object partner sometimes acts as a subject partner. In other words, the man will give and show love to the woman, but sometimes it's reversed. The woman will show love to the man. And ju that's just how God made it. God made it for us to be in that way. Next. Loyalty, feel our piety and fidelity. In interpersonal relationships, the beauty that a subordinate returns in response to the love of superior is called loyalty. And the beauty that children return in response to the love of their parents is called filial piety. The beauty that a wife returns in response to the love of her husband is called fidelity. We all want to show that to each other. Purpose of love and beauty. What is the purpose of love? Do you ever ask that? What's the purpose of love? What's the purpose of beauty? First of all, before I even get into the, that is what God's heart was full of love and beauty because that came out from him. That's what his creation was. When you create something, it, it shows what you're all about. So God is all of love and beauty. Let's read. The purpose of love and beauty is to enable two wholesome beings springing forth from God to establish the four position foundation and then realize the purpose of creation by sharing your love and the beauty, go back, sharing love and beauty with each other. They join together in harmonious oneness. This is then becoming the third object partner to God. So you see, we realize the purpose of creation because God wanted the subject partner and the object object partner to form a union with God in the middle, in the center for the love and the beauty for the purpose of creation. Next, the love of God. Next, let us investigate the nature of the love of God. Well, we have three kinds of love. We have the parental love. This is the love of the first object partner. Conju conjugal love, which is the love of the second object partner and children's love, which is a love of the third object part, partner. This is all fulfilling the purpose of creation. Had Adam and Eve attained perfection, each becoming a substantial object partner to God, resembling one of his dual characteristics, 
they would have then joined as husband and wife and raise their children in a godly family. In so doing, they would have experienced three kinds of original love with the three, their three object partners, which we just talked about. Parental love, that is the love of the first object partner. Conjugal love, that is the love with the second object partner. And the children's love, which is the love of the third object partner. Next. Only then would they complete the three object purpose and form the four position foundation. This would be the fulfillment of their purpose of creation. And that's not just somebody else's purpose of creation. That's everyone's purpose of creation for that fulfillment of the object purpose and for, to form the four position foundation. Next. God's love is the subject to the three kinds of love flowing through the four position foundation. Therefore, God's love is manifested through the various loves of the three object partners. It is the underlying force which breathes life into the four position foundation. We cannot have this without God. It just, we just read that the underlying force which breathes life into the four position foundation, we can't do it without God. God has, again, I will repeat it. God is the center. He is in charge. He is the creator. And he breathes into the four position foundation for us, not only to have, but to enjoy. Next. Accordingly, the four position foundation and we see here, God, with God's love, there's Adam and Eve and the children. That's a four position foundation, which is the purpose of creation to be complete. The four position foundation is the vessel of perfect beauty. Isn't that beautiful? That uh, to know, just to know that we have that knowledge to know that there's a four position foundation that we can be a part of through which we can receive and enjoy the fullness of God's love. It is also the home of perfect joy and the wellspring of goodness. Upon this ground is what? The purpose of creation then is what? It is complete. Next. Good and evil. We all know there's good and evil. We deal with it probably on a daily basis. Let's hear about it. An act or its result is considered good when it fulfills God's purpose of creation. This takes place when the subject and the object partners unite. That's good through the harmonious and spirited give and take of love and beauty. Become the third object partner to God and form the four position foundation. An act or its result is considered evil when, only when it violates God's purpose of creation. By forming a four position foundation under the dominion of Satan. Now, which one do you want to do here? It's very clear. It's very clear. We don't want to follow uh, the Satan part that violates the purpose of creation. But he tries, Satan tries to violate that. But we are under God and the union with, between the subject partner and the object partner, fulfilling the purpose of creation. This is called what? It's called good. Next. Righteousness and unrighteousness. Righteousness, what? Well, it refers to that quality in a person which leads him to pursue goodness and further its purpose. But unrighteousness refers to that quality in a person which leads him to pursue evil and further its satanic person. So if you have righteous person, they're going to pursue goodness. An unrighteous person is going to pursue, pursue evil. Which one are we? Ask yourself, which one am I? Next. Okay, we're ready for next week's session. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being on the call.
call tonight and I hope you receive something. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. Wow. Uh, can we give Dr. Tanya Elbert uh, an amount, uh, a great hand clap for this great, wow, how beautiful um, the creation is. Wow. Um, putting everything into perspective like that is, it, it's such a, a great uh, thing. Uh, now at this time, we're going to open up the floor for commentary uh, from no one other than our very own Reverend Mark Hernandez. Uh, Reverend Hernandez, are you there, sir? I am here. Thank you so much, Pastor Antonio. What is so unique about this revelation from Jesus through Father and Mother Moon, through Father Moon, on original value, the what the principle is getting across is something we haven't even talked about before. Um, we haven't actually, maybe philo philosophical people have uh, discussed what, you know, how you determine the value of something and how value is determined. But it's been rarely talked about in theological circles at all. Um, and for that reason, it might seem kind of odd that it's placed here uh, in the chapter one, the principles of creation. But we have to remember that the principle of creation, this chapter of the divine principle, this revelation from Jesus through Father Moon is so that we can understand what God's original ideal was, God's original plan. Basically, in the world of religion, we basically have picked up all these broken pieces and we've tried to make sense out of them. We often call things a mystery and are satisfied with just a mystery. But really, when we, when we go to the heart of the divine principle, and what we've been looking at is relationships, the relationship, especially as uh, enlightened by the principle of creation, that the relationship of subject and object, the relationship of that subject partner and object partner you were talking about today, it continues in the topic of original value because, and what I really loved was that it talks about the fact that until now, in this fallen world, we have not been able to look at things, the whole creation ourselves or anything, and come near to understanding the true value of those things. You know, Paul you know, illustrates it when he talks about the creation groaning in travail, waiting for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God, the children of God. We would imagine in that word that Paul is receiving also a revelation that it is only when God's true sons and daughters can come about that we'll be able to see the value of creation and treat creation the way it should have been treated, the way it should have been loved, the way it should have been governed, the way it should have been uh, it should have just like shouted out, like the Bible says is that, you know, the creation sings praises to us. Uh, that's teaching us about God. But because we've been in our fallen state, which of course we're going to go to the fall in study. And that's why original value is in this section of the principle of creation, because it's trying to get us prepared to see the whole picture of God's intent. And that's why, as you taught today, you were saying that originally, the value of anything created, that value would hold an absolute value because its creator and the creator's purpose and intention for it is absolute. But we being fallen, we haven't seen the absolute value of our oceans of our forests, of our water. And can we all admit that we have not understood our own value or the value of any other human being to the depth that God values those things, to the depth that our Lord Jesus. We can see God in Jesus because Jesus was able to love us, even though in our fallen state, 
you know, we may not have deserved that love, but he loved and he offered his life for us. Because he, as a true man, he could see true value. He could see original value. Satan might be talking about human beings and say how, how worthless we are. But Jesus would be able to say, no, these are God's, these are God's children. God created them in the most amazing way. But apart from that, in our fallen state, unfortunately, we have not even entertained the conversation about original value. And that's why this section is so, uh, it's so deep. It is remarkable. It's like a precious jewel right there in the principle of creation. Uh, another thing that, uh, you know, some people don't even think about that idea that a true subject, again, who's the truest subject? Our heavenly parent, our creator, God, right? Don't we often say God is good just part of the time? Oh. Some of the time? No, we say God is good all the time. Absolutely good. Because God is that subject partner of love. God that, is that subject partner who just in the transmission of his love and her love is able to experience the joy of loving. Whereas, unfortunately, we as fallen people, we're just absorbed with the joy of receiving. But, but that, that love that get, that's given, that force giving out subject, that subjective force given out, we call it love, and how the object returns that the, the divine principle calls it beauty. <clears throat> and it talks about the force of beauty. So it doesn't call, it, it actually calls it a force, which I think is so beautiful because both of them are a force, the force of love and the force of beauty. Uh, it does say one is active and one is passive. But again, so many of these terms of subject and object and of, uh, of uh, uh, like active and passive, they've been kind of unfortunately, uh, they've been hijacked by Satan, by this fallen world. Many times when we think of the terms of subject and object, we often think of the domination that the subject will have on the object. Uh, and we don't see it in the heavenly original light that the subject exists for the total purpose of the object. The subject exists to pour out their being, to pour out their love to their object. And the object in response wants to return naturally a love that has the perfume of, uh, and has the look of the radiance of beauty. Amen. Someone just chatted that Jesus is the first person to exhibit. Yes, he is. He is the first person. He is the first person to see with God's eyes, to smell with God's nose, to hear with God's ears. That is something that God has been longing for all of his children. But again, because we presuppose the fall was meant to happen, we don't ask these questions. We don't even go to the topic of original value. And as you were also teaching, uh, Dr. Tanya, you were saying that within, within love, there is beauty, within beauty, there is love. Because again, this has not been to, to be a static relationship of, of up and down, of subject and object. This is meant to be a dynamic, you know, as you were teaching last week, spherical, circular, elliptical, you know, magical dance and movement so that God, and, and we, we learned last week about that each of the four positions, right, is meant to take the other three as its object partners. We talked about that triple objective purpose, that every position of the four position foundation, it's not a static thing, that God God himself, God herself, wants to be on the receiving side, deserves to be on the receiving side. 
and that God placed us in a position through our love that we can, we can delight our parents' heart. Adam can delight the parents' heart, Eve can delight the parents' heart, and the child, the child, the unfallen child of Adam and Eve can delight the heart of God. The I know reading these slides really is challenging. I thank you for that too, because you're talking about something on a, on a paper, on a slide that's very one-dimensional. But what you're really talking about is something that's dynamic, again, spherical, and very much alive. And again, unfortunately, we have not known our value. But what this, the first time I ever studied this, I was blown away because I thought, wow, this is telling us, this is telling me that my original value is actually, as I live my life, as I live a principal life, I'm going to be experiencing on an ongoing basis the, the awe of coming to understand the value of others and the value of all things. As you were saying earlier, when we look at the value of a rose, the value of a rose is a determined, you know, uh, I think when I was actually having a conversation with, uh, with Dr. Tanya earlier, as we were going over this material, I mentioned to her the fact that uh, there are philosophies that basically say that the human mind is just a, a blank tablet, uh, a, a, and we're just ready to receive and be inputted on by uh, the stimulation of our surroundings, you know, the, the stimuli of a rose or the stimuli uh, of uh, a certain thing that we're looking at, a star or a stone or a crystal. And what the divine principle and what actually uh, unification thought teach is that actually within the human being, we have already an aptitude we're looking for the symmetry. We're looking for the hand of God. And asymmetrical things are not as delightful to our eyes as symmetrical. You know, all the patterns that we see within the creation. So um, uh, we're talking about that when we were studying. Tonight, she concluded with righteousness and unrighteousness. And, and uh, actually, before that, looking at good and evil. And again, good and evil, we talk about it as a result of the fall. We talk about righteousness and unrighteousness as a result of the fall. Um, the What is so amazing when I think about human beings who are born in iniquity after the fall, but yet make every effort to pursue righteousness. How, how, how pleasing that must be to God that despite our being shaped with iniquity, when we come to the knowledge of our Savior, when we come to the knowledge of God's substantial love through a Savior, through Jesus, then, and even it's amazing that there are people who follow their conscience and pursue it without a knowledge of Jesus. Because God's innate original DNA, his original imprint is there. And we're seeking for those things. We're seeking for a, a life of righteousness. It's almost like that internal compass. And, and uh, I think we're going to get more onto that topic as we study uh, in the 12-hour DP. I want to thank you again, Dr. Tanya, for going through this material. I know, especially with all the bumps we had, it's not an easy thing. Um, and I just appreciate the the conversation the uh some of the the chat that i've been looking at uh, dr rouse was just saying that 
environment and genetics of the rose determines its appearance at our endorsement of its beauty. So be it in our lives when we believe in love, the um, I don't know if that's a, a typo or the, the inject of our love has more beauty than we ever imagined before the love of the object. Oh, the, I see. The object of our love <laughs> has more beauty than, uh, has, of our love has more beauty than we ever imagined before the love of the object. That is really true. That's really beautiful. Um, you know, Dr. Hernandez, can I interject something please, here? Please, please. I was um, asking you to you do You know, that. we're talking about the rose and the beauty of the rose and God's creation. However, God created so many more flowers of beauty and of fragrance. And that's the way mankind is. We're like a variety of flowers that God has created on earth. And we have a beauty within us and we have a fragrance. And when I say a fragrance, I mean our spirit, our soul and our attitude and things that, that you see in me and I see in you. And that's our beauty. That's our aroma. And I think it's so beautiful. You have to pardon my computer. It's really messing up. Uh, it's so beautiful how God not only built and made creation, but he made humankind, as we've talked about before, man and woman. But not only that, the, the beauty of, of having children, but flowers reproducing, uh, uh, the beauty of, of the world reproducing. And when I say that, I mean nature. Uh, you know, the animals, I always say animals take better care of their children than most, a lot of humans. Um, because they really want to see, you know, humans, we, ha we hear about almost on a daily basis, how they don't take care of their children or have, you know, maybe killed them or left them or deserted them or done this or done that. But the, the human instinct of the natural world doesn't do that. So that has something to say about how we are manifested from creation of God, along with the beauty. We were the last of his creation. Not only that, a woman was the last of his creation. And a woman is full of beauty and love and all kinds of things we don't really want to get into, but you can understand and, and think about that that his last, very last creation, the beauty that God had put into a woman. And so for that, I'm, I'll am i turn it back over to you. Yeah, I'm really grateful that uh, God finished everything off with such a masterpiece uh, as woman. Yes, uh, Father Moon was often talking about God's ultimate masterpiece or penultimate masterpiece uh, being woman uh, because... Yes. In that embodiment, you know, men men can speak words of life, but we can't give life uh, that a woman can give, and, right. and all that she, uh, all that a mother will go through, and yet once the the baby is born, you know, only want to lavish love and forget all of her her pain and all the things that she went through. It's really very much, uh, you know, I I get why. Uh, the, the Jewish understanding of uh, that, you know, God couldn't be everywhere, so he made mothers. Uh, he made that beautiful image of, of woman. I want to thank you for uh, coming and making some extra comments. We have Dr. Rouse with us, so I just feel so blessed uh, to uh, ask Dr. Rouse to make some comments if I'm not intruding in your private time, Dr. Rouse. We thank you for joining us tonight and also uh, helping us straighten things out when I was trying to get uh, technically right with uh, Dr. Edwards. Are you available to make any comments tonight, Dr. Rouse? Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming on tonight. And I was reading Brother Breland as he was responding tonight and just listening to you, Dr. Edwards, Pastor Antonio Bowen. Wow. 
a great night. You know, I almost hated for it to end when Dr. Edwards said, okay, we're ready, get ready for next week. Dr. Edwards, you could have gone on and on tonight. It, it, was, I mean, it was just coming through, just perfect for us. I want to say this to everyone that's listening. My heart was moved tonight just in the concept of beauty. As the, the essence in this message for me is a call to see the beauty in others. I also sense that it may not be meant just for me as an individual in the consideration to see the beauty in everything or every, everyone. But others may see the beauty in that that is existing, a beauty that I do not see in that object. I will never be the subject for that object. But the value of that object and for the existence of those that see the beauty in it is just as valuable and has as much worth as anything that I have within me or I see outside of me. Therefore, I'm not to damage it. I'm not to try to cast it away. With that in mind, I ask all of you to pray that somehow we can come to where Father and Mother Moon has asked us to be. The people who are sincere and true to what God desires for each and everyone in the world. Just to love. Stop the violence, true mother says. Mm -hmm. If we can just see the value of the beauty of just allowing people to be, then that rose that is smelling so sweet and looking so beautiful to someone may have an ultimate value for us too. Thank you for tonight. Dr. Hernandez, greatly appreciate you. and want everybody on this call to know, I appreciate your dedication, knowing all of the things that you are continuously striving to do to get everybody home, to get everybody to understand Chumbo, to get everybody to understand why this kingdom will be so beautiful if we look back and just love God and appreciate God from the time of history through our ancestors, then we can gain the value of what it is for us to exist now, looking towards our descendants and knowing that our descendants can look back and value us too. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Marie and I love you. God loves you too. Dr. Edwards, Keep doing what you do. Love you to the highest degree for sharing with us each week. Tell your hubby, get ready. His time is coming. God bless you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Dr. Dr. Rouse. And I just want everybody to know today is Dr. Rouse and Marie Rouse's 12th blessing anniversary. They were blessed on 10 10 10. 12 yes. Years ago, they received the holy marriage blessing. Congratulations on your 12th Thank anniversary. you. And we pray that everyone will receive the same. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. And I'm so grateful. We, we began with that beautiful uh, prayer by Bishop Nancy Rosario. She asked that the Holy Spirit be encamped around us. I thought that word was so beautiful. I love that song, encamped along the hills of light. Uh, but uh, yeah, I could feel the, the heavenly the Holy Spirit encamped around us. Uh, thank you, Bishop. And now, uh, I hope I don't surprise her, but she's been on the screen the whole time. Um, I'd like to ask Minister Win Wendy Hurstein to close us in prayer tonight. Wendy, would you be able to do that? Bless us with the closing you, prayer. Sure. Thank you. Sure, thanks. I'm honored. Emily Parent, we're grateful to come together tonight. Um, thank you so much. We we heard some beautiful understandings of uh, your words that came through Jesus, 
through our true parents. Yes. And um, we're just so grateful for the uplifting of pastors throughout this nation because they're the ones who are reaching the young people, helping them find you, helping them find your love and truth. And we truly want to unite together and join our strengths. So we thank you for everybody who came on this call tonight. And uh, we offer this time together in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Minister Hursty.